Hi everyone, uh, my name is Peter Neubauer and uh, I'm going to update you on the state of the NFJ Spatial Project which we uh, started um, about one and a half years ago. So, um, how many of you know NFJ? Is there anyone? Okay, just a very, very brief recap. Um, we're hiring. <laughs> That's not a recap. Please contact me if you're interested and if you're awesome. Yeah, what is the NFJ? Um, it's, a, it's a database that stores things in graphs, which is like nodes, relationships, and uh, properties on these. That's the basic model. Um, with that, you, you model your domain. This is, for instance, a, a customer relationship management or like a CMS uh, management system with, with uh, data structures around it. This is like a, a, a network topology network in data centers. We have all these things mapped up. And, um, and yeah, it looks like this. Um, actually, this is spatial, so this, this hosted instance has Liechtenstein uh, OpenStreetMap read in, so it's about what is like one half million relationships, some here, and properties, and so on. So, so what you do is you go to um, the first node. And uh, well, and uh, you can you can basically explore the whole thing. Um, in three, you have something there, or you just look at it graphically. Um, what this is, and you explore. Uh, how do you query a graph? A graph is kind of hard to query, um, very ordered. So we have a number of of languages built in. Just of this thing. Um, one of them is, is a Groovy like uh, Trebuzel language, which uh, gives you a couple of answers here. And you go like step out, step in between the vertices and so on. And then we have we have some um, uh, SQL like language, which is Cypher, which, which probably is easier to grasp. You, you start with a node, um, say, uh, node 4 or something. And then uh, you match something uh, to match um, root as some relationship of some thing with something um, and return um, root uh, r um, and and then you get like some kind of, kind of um, pattern matching in the graph. See, there's like a user and there's a change set and so on. But that's just like a, a short intro. So, so it's a it's a database that can handle graphs in, in, in big ways. Um, so what is the interface spatial? Um, we came up with the idea that many of these uh, spatial data sets, for instance, of the are in reality quite complicated data structures. So if you can handle the graph efficiently, then you can easily model spatial data structures in these graphs. Now, normally a, a data set isn't spatial in itself. You have, uh, you, you have a domain data set where you have, and as we saw before, you have your entities, and some of them have uh, spatial attributes and have like longitude, latitude, and so on. What you want to do is, is of course, do, do the normal like search within distance search, the, the, the normal stuff. But what is really interesting is to project uh, this this thing into the spatial world. So you can you can adapt your domain data set into the GIS and layers. And, and, and there's a there's a number of, of things that are important in GIS. That is, for instance, layers, that is polygons, that is uh, projections and all that stuff that is normally not in your in your domain. You just collect statuses from your friends and you attach locations to them. And how, how do I project that into? Give me the uh, current locations of my friends as a polygon with an inner hole in uh, wh wh where I don't know the people. So, so I have like an outskirt of where my friends are. Uh, that that is kind of GIS operations you would do, but you you can't do. It, uh, with anything that's that, that's out out there really from your from domain data set. So 
we have some core components or com some core concerns that we've been working with. Uh, one is of course storage. How do we how do we model these things? Um, search. How how can we search a, a data set, especially when you have the possibility to move through the data structure very fast? Um, Geoprocessing. How can we um, how can we provide advanced uh, um, uh, functions that that make it possible, for instance, to detect same edges, these, these polygons are touching each other, by physically looking in, into the data structure and, and detecting that, oh, these nodes and the relationships in between are the same. It's not that, that, that the latitude and longitude properties happen to be the same. This is actually, these are actually touching. This is a topology. Um, so we want to we wanna improve on this, even introducing like, things like routing or, or shortest path or, or, or these things. Um, and then, of course, import-export. How do you get in like OpenStreetMap or, or KML or shapefiles or whatever there is? Um, in order to this to be useful, you saw, you saw the database there. Uh, that, that is, that's the raw data. What you want to do in GIS uh, is to use the existing uh, stacks that can expose this. What, what, what Christine was, was showing was like webmap services and, and webmap feature servers and so on. So, so we provide uh, extensions to plug this in, in the geo tools and geo server to serve the like KML and whatever you need um, into UDIG, uh, which is a, a um, um, Java like RCP based uh, spatial editor. Uh, sadly, it doesn't support like topologies yet, but it will come to that. Um, and support OpenStreetMap, which is one of the most accessible uh, spatial datasets out there. It has a couple of very cool features that, 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 that makes it very prone to, to working on. So how does that work? Um, we, have the, we have the raw graph here. And uh, what we do here is to add indexing structures to, to this like, domain info that you might have. Um, then we enhance like on the fly uh, views on this graph, like I, I traverse through the graph and I add things that, that normally are not in this data set. For instance, how do I get from, from a traversal, which I will, will show you later, to a, um, a structure that is understandable by a GIS, for instance a polygon or a line stream or whatever. Um, then uh, uh, how do I query, how do I encode like what I'm actually interested in? Dynamic styles, we have added like support for the for the uh, SLDs of, of, of GeoServer, so you can actually, while defining a layer, uh, uh, also if you want to uh, define how this, this is going to be styled uh, and not out here in the GIS stacks. Um, and then dynamic meta info, like, like the, uh, 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 the coordinate system, if that is like VGS84 or, or, or whatever. And, uh, and other stuff like like the geometry types and so um, so that's the, the basic thing. The outcomes a view uh, that is suitable for for here for GIS stacks to look at, which normally is a layered approach, which is kind of limiting. Uh, if you look at it, uh, a layer is basically already sliced data. From a layer, you can't. You, this is why why mashups are not sufficient for GIS operations because they they. On the client side, you have no idea if if these two streets that you see on different levels on, on Google Maps or, or a mashup of Google Maps and OpenStreetMap, if these are the same. Uh, the, the human eye can infer that or someone else, but, but not the machine if you don't have references. So if you come from a connected data set, then it's totally stupid to expose this. You want you, you want to you want actually advanced processing capability. That's what every GIS system does. Uh, but normally it's not, not that accessible to a application developer that, that has a Rails application here that puts in stuff. So so I will briefly talk about like the different aspects that that, that we were forced to deal with. Uh, OpenStreetMap um, basics and then layers, indexes, starting geoprocessing routing and, and some examples where, where, where this stuff is used. So OpenStreetMap, uh, what's cool about OpenStreetMap, it's, it's a very big wiki. The interesting thing is the geographic part of that wiki is 
comparably small. There's like points of interest that you put in, but the bulk of the logic of OpenStreetMap or the data set is in the ways and the relations and the tags. And all these are basically undefined. You can have relations of relations and you can have like tags. There's no standard enforced um, ontology for this. So, so it's a very interesting data set. Um, and it is a topology. The, the nodes that are in there are referred by, by other relations. And so these are not, these are not constructs that, that, that you normally see like in one-on binaries or one-on text. This is, this is actually a, a connected graph. However, when you uh, export it, you have like nodes that get listed and then ways and, and normally also relations here that refer to, to these, these things. But the, um, uh, the information here is largely duplicated. You have the change sets that are repeated. You have, uh, um, you have all these like, references that, that go back and might or might not be there. And so so there's, there's a lot of duplication. Uh, however, we, uh, we built like, a, a graph model out of this. So, so what you see here is the nodes here. And then, um, so they have longitude, latitude here. Um, this is actually all the change that is now factored out. You'll see that in, a, in an, uh, another version. Then you have a way, for instance, here. You have the way OSM ID here. Um, and we modeled that way that, that uh, a way and its way nodes that are here, for instance, uh, they start with the first node relationship to a proxy node uh, that then goes down to, to this node. Uh, because uh, when when you then define a way as the traversal that starts here goes to next, next, next until it can go on and and gets uh, uh, the um, the points by by following the node relationship in one. So so this is our way right here. Um, then we can deal with with uh, uh, cases where the other another way might be a lane and it goes in this direction. If you, if, you had, if you had done it on this level, you would basically just get a lot of stuff here. And here you have the next way that starts at the same way here. So we know this is a topology. We know that these two are linked by a crossing. Um, and then you have the higher order relationships that are uh, the uh, relations here. There's like Sertables Barnum, which is like a, yeah, it, it uh, consists of this way and on this way. And there's another one that is uh, another arbitrary uh, relation that, that consists of the both ways and some more. Um, and then you have the tagging here, which is totally free. So, so that's another thing. If you, if you look at the OpenStreetMap exports, um, they're very poor because when you wander through this, this thing and say, export all the ways, this is a way that is, uh, that, that is consisting of other ways, and it might be tagged not here. For instance, here, this is a, a um, whatever that is, like this, this is a bridge that goes over here. Um, but there might be a tag here, and it might not say bridge, it must, might say like wrongly spelled bridge. But we still want to fish that out. This data set is very, very fuzzy, and also, uh, the data set's interesting because this is just a base data set. People are starting to push back since you can push back changes. This is a, this is a free storage backend for arbitrary data. So, so uh, uh, NGOs, for instance, are, are starting to push back um, statistical information. This might be a school, for instance. Say this is a school. And you just attach a tag like uh, pupils 2010. And then next year you come and attach a tag people 2011. So OpenStreetMap is not a spatial data set for streets. It's like a whatever, like a Wikipedia for everything uh, that might have spatial attributes to it. So if you look at a street here, um, here, here you see it a bit better. Here's the street node, and then you have like first node relationship. Here are the waypoints that, that belong to two change sets. Craig Taverner has, has been doing like one change set and then the other one. Uh, this version, the first version was done by him, but this is actually version two, so, so you see the latest version of these things here. Um, and then the way is actually a traversal that goes down here and grabs the nodes and transforms them into, uh, in, into a line screen. Uh, and then you have the tags and so on. 
So this is a, a, a basic OpenStreetMap data setting of the spatial. So what happens is that, that we, to this domain data set that in itself is not spatial, it's just like a structure of data, right? We add now um, definitions of what is to be a layer, and then we say what is to be a geometry in here, and index that in a, in this case, an artery in the graph. Neo4j is very, very fast, so, so a, a traversal through the graph, uh, Neo4j does about one to two million traversals per second. Um, a, an external index lookup, for instance, in Lucene or, or whatever you take, takes about a millisecond. So that's like a thousand pops it takes to, to do that. And, and, and if, if you look at these nodes, you're much, much faster to have in-graph indexing. In this case, you can, of course, take that externally. But, but yeah, so, so we have the domain data set, and then we have some definition structure here, which I will uh, uh, explain a bit more. And then we have the indexing substructure here. So these are the basic graph components that are, that are in there. Um, so what are layers in the image spatial? Um, basically, there are no layers. We don't want layers. But still, uh, we have to have them. Uh, a geometry encoder is when you construct a layer in, in, in this system, you provide uh, an image spatial with a method how to get from a graph traversal or a graph to a, a, a geometry. A very, very easy one is, of course, to take one property of your data set, for instance, that says, like, oh, this is my well known text. Um, so you have, a, you have a node and it says, like, um, uh, shape and it has well known text. And your encoder says, yeah, whatever there is, I'm giving that back as the geometry. Right? But that's not very graphic because this information is denormalized. What's a bit better is to have a number of properties assigned to that. If you have a, for instance, if you have a very simple geometry, a point, then longitude, latitude might surface to, to just construct a point and, and give that back. And that's, that's a normal case of, of spatial indexes, like what you know in Foursquare and so, like you have points. Uh, a bit more complex is then uh, a subgraph, where you actually say, um, what, what we saw there, um, if I get uh, a, number of, a, a, a number of points or a number of segments or so, I will actually construct a, a subgraph of that. And that can be anything uh, uh, in the graph. And I can do even more, so, so, so this would actually construct a, a little subgraph that says this is, the, this is the way or this is the polygon. So I can attach like other nodes to it, to, to the endpoints and so on. Uh, and what you have seen before, that was like a, a domain specific adapter that says, oh yeah, I go to these nodes and then I hop there and then I fish out this and then do all that stuff, right? So I can adapt this geometry encoder to anything I want. And what I see then in the, uh, from the spatial layers is, is totally dynamic. I'm not doing anything to my domain data set. I mean it clean. So some, some other stuff I need is, of course, the, the uh, geometry type. There we have a, a, a bit of a hassle because most of the uh, uh, geo stacks are kind of uh, limited in that a layer normally only can uh, contain one geometry. So, so if I have a layer, it has all, either to be points or, or, or whatever. Uh, then styling and, and dynamic layers, I will say more to that. And searching, of course. So in UDIC, for instance, if you look at this, you have a uh, OpenStreetMap data set, and then you define whatever you want here as, as layers, and these are dynamically displayed then uh, via the GeoTools stack into, uh, into this. So, so you don't have to like, export and import shape files or whatever. You can actually combine these to whatever you want which is very, very powerful, uh, especially for, for publishing and re mashing up or fishing out your own domain information and, and mashing that up. You could say uh, only the cycle ways that have more than 50 points or whatever, or, or that are like very near me or so. 
Uh, same thing happened with GeoServer. This, this works through the stack. So this is a GeoServer uh, VMS endpoint that then can be consumed by, by things like, like the GeoPort. Um, indexes, um, if you look at a, a for instance, a quad tree um, where, you, where you divide spatial information until you have met some rules, say in, in every quad here, there's only one point of interest max. This is from Wikipedia. But if you if you turn that into an index, it becomes a tree. Right? So so that is what we use for default. We use an R tree, but it could be anything. So what you see here is the beginning. Um, here's our way again. And here we assign a geometry of type 2, which is a string. And it has like eight vertices that is superfluous information. We, we can actually infer that here. Uh, but it has a bounding box, and this bounding box is then indexed in our little R tree beginning here. So here is the the R tree reference relationship. That that means we can actually do bounding box searches on on, on these ways by going here, or we can have arbitrary many indexes connected to this. Uh, and 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 so again, uh, what I said before the the uh, Index is, is in the graph. Now, what is quite cool is that, that of course you can you can expose this information to the geo stacks uh, through geo tools and so. But what we also want is to to expose it through the normal Java APIs, and and, and these are normally something that you saw in my, in my in my little search here. You get nodes back, not geometries or something, because you have to understand geometries. If you come from non-spatial environments, you can't deal with that. So, so what we're trying to do is to, to expose these, these things even through a normal, uh, a normal indexing API. So you just say, oh, I have a, a, a layer uh, index, and I can ask that for, for something like longitude and latitude, and, and for a bounding box query, and put in the string, and I get nodes back. These nodes will not be shapes or cool like polygons or so, but they will be the geometry nodes that I that I index there. And then I have myself to go there and fish out whatever I wanted and I say, oh yeah, this is my shape. So I have to be more careful about what I what I actually get back. And there's a different query languages, but it just plugs into the normal APIs. For styling we decided to to do uh, much as GeoServer does, which is you, you filter on uh, on, on uh, features and on, on attributes, and then you provide styling information. Uh, for instance, here you have uh, is it a green stroke of, of width three, and then you you put a red stroke over, uh, which which then is something like here, like it it, it gets it gets over um, over stroke by the by this. Uh, Geoprocessing is a wide field. Uh, we have a Google Summer of Code dealing with that right now. Uh, the default is, of course, to do it in, in memory, which, for instance, the Java topology suite does. Uh, you have different, different things there, for instance, outputs. How do I process a geometry so it can conform to different outputs, K KML, GeoGSAM, JSON, and so on. Um, some others are, uh, for instance, to access different parts of a geometry. Uh, the end point, the first point, the middle section, uh, or whatever. All that is, is, is part of this. Um, and then you have a, a processing where you where actually see what, what is the um, uh, disjoints, what's the junction, what is the uh, geometry together, together, and so on. Right now, this is built in by the Java topology suite, which means we construct the geometries from the graph. If you have two of these, for instance, uh, uh, disjoint, are they like together or not? We construct these two geometries via our layers, and, and then we do this in memory. What the next step is, is to actually put that into the graph and add meaning to it and actually see, oh, these are not sharing any nodes, and, and, and so, so we can put that down to the database and not into, into memory, so we can actually handle very big data sets. And uh, yeah, thanks to Andreas who's doing this stuff right now. Also what you can add if you have 
if you have a graph, is that you do this geoprocessing easily can add uh, routing because you can actually do uh, graph algorithms in, in, in your data set. Uh, this is uh, ju just a random example, but uh, what is happening, for instance, here is we have Seattle here and, and we have San Francisco and so on and so on. So, so we can do, for instance, an A-star routing in, in this graph that is also a GIS data set. So, so you can do very, very interesting things and, and what we're thinking about is to add routing support to OpenStreetMap also. So, so part of your geoprocessing could be find closest way between two geometries, which is normally not doable, but, but you can do that if you have the connected data set in the background. Um, there is some projects being done with this. This is, for instance, a routing through Dublin. Um, where people have read in all the schedules from, from Dublin Transport, uh, project that in a graph, and then um, between different subgraphs of those schedules, um, added um, uh, different, um, different walks. How long does it take from, to walk from one station to another? So now you can do routing by finding like, the, closest, uh, the closest points, and then do routing between the different schedules. So I can just click on the on the map and get a routing. Uh, where do I need to, to go? This is this is totally non uh, uh, pre-computed, which is the, the normal way to do to do these these things, right? So this is going dynamically through the graph and then delivering the the things back. So that's what we want to have in in, in the place spatial too. One interesting example of what you can do in practice with this is uh, a bit along the line of what, what, what Christine uh, said. Here we have a merge, a German merge. This is done for the European Inspire Organ, uh, Initiative, where you want to expose uh, open geodata from, from governments. The problem is many governments don't, don't have like uh, GIS licenses or, or experts who can do this. So, so what's being built is a uh, a web-based um, UDIG um, server that also has GeoServer built in. So what you see in this area is actually a web map feature uh, with open layers uh, that you operate on. And from a data set, for instance here, uh, that's the south of Germany read in an open street map, and then define a couple of um, dynamic uh, layers through this, this graph. You can just pull them onto whatever you want to have here and then create your map, style it, and then just click in here and then you say save and what you get is a VMS endpoint that you can publish. So the only work that needs to be done is then to take your data set and write these little adapters, these geometry encoders, decoders, that you can so, so, so you can put them into, in, into the GIS stack. And then the whole thing works. So, so it's very easy to take like, whatever you have and, and do it. Um, another example for, for this is, um, for instance, uh, network topology management, where we have, you see here the graph structure that, is, the, that here has a, a spatial data set. And you see drive data. Uh, and you see cell towers here, and so on. So you see actually antennas with azimuths. This, this is the antenna here. So it's a hierarchy that is displayed this way. Um, city antenna and uh, city cell tower antenna. This is like city cell tower antenna. And, uh, uh, and, and, and then you can do like very, very interesting graphing operations on a spatial data set, for instance, to display the the, the signal strength between cell towers, and then infer that, oh, if, if, if the signal strength here is yellow or like uh, fuzzier than, than it should be, then you know that, oh, probably the, the frequencies need to be changed here. These are like very hard problems to, uh, to do. Um, I'm wondering what, what the time is. 10 minutes. 10 minutes. 10 minutes, okay. So, uh, let me just go through the next steps here. Um, 
as I said before, we want to expose this functionality. It's, it's very, like, very much we can do. Uh, the problem is that many of these uh, uh, things are too hard accessible for developers. So what we want to do is to, to expose this into the Java world, the Ruby world, the, the normal programming world without having to know too much about, uh, about these, these structures and so. So, so we're working very hard on, on uh, integrating NeoFJ Spatial into normal, normal stacks, not only the GIS stacks. Um, as I said before, graph geoprocessing is very, very cool. You, you, if you have good data sets, and for instance, OpenStreetMap is a good data set, you can do a lot of things on the data set itself instead of reading up shapes and then, and then just seeing if they overlap. That is just a, a, a fraction of what you can do. You could, for instance, then in the graph infer, they say, oh, give me all the, um, all the streets in Portland where there are more than five potholes and color them red. That is interesting stuff, not only if they overlap or not. Uh, and you can do that if you go like down to the graph and, 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 and do this. And it would just mix into the, into the exposure stacks. Um, index performance, of course, what we have written right now, scales so-so, we have read in uh, uh, Germany OpenStreetMap, which is 20 million nodes in this model and about 80 million relationships. And uh, it's doable, but it's a bit, it's, it's not as sleek as we want to have it. But still, that's very good because everything's dynamic. I mean, there's no, there's no like blob store, postages, something in there. You actually like do live searches, which is quite cool. Um, you want to have the the indexing pluggable, so you can have like external indexes, internal indexes, and so on. Um, and we are playing with n-dimensional indexes that are not only two-dimensional or one-dimensional. If you have, for instance, a timeline or something that is a that is a one-dimensional index, and, and, and they, a two is like a quad tree or a tree is nice. But if you have more scalar values, for instance, like population or anything that's scalar and you can project that into multi-dimensional index, then you can do range queries and spatial queries in one lookup. You don't have to intersect things. You can actually go like through an n-dimensional bounding box and just say, give me all the geometries that are according to these four parameters. You index into the properties of the vertices, right? No, that def no the, they, they don't even have to be properties. We could, for instance, construct a geometry that is uh, the geographic center of some subgraph. That is then the, or just a point where there really is a line string in the background. But if you have a composite index, uh, it, it, in the end, the geometry node that, that holds this information is uh, having a bounding box because our index is a two-dimensional index and it excludes stuff by going two-dimensional down. What we want to do is with a composite index is that we could have like 10 of these properties and we would have kind of like a 10 dimensional bounding box that gives us not only longitude, latitude, uh, and then be able to do a search, a range query, not only on long longitude, latitude, but on all these eight other things in one lookup. What you have to do now is of course to stop with the bounding box or something else, you have to do like kind of query optimization, which way you go, um, but if you can if you can do that in one, then that is very very much cheaper, especially in big data sets because you exclude this. Of course, at, at one at some point, the meta structure of an index grows bigger than the. I mean, there's a trade-off, but but for four, five, six properties, depending on the on, on the um, uh, distance and, and, and on the um, distribution of the properties, this could turn out to be a very very interesting feature for bigger data sets. And then we want to introduce routable layers where you can have not only geoprocessing, which is very like spatial focused, but even, for instance, routing processing. So you can find between geometries routes along different uh, uh, constraints. Give me, give me all the buildings in Portland that have uh, a, uh, a driving distance along the streets, tertiary, 
are closer than two miles to the nearest shore. That is very interesting to, to ask in these data sets, right? And that's, that's something you can't do with anything else. You, you have to have the connected data set. And you can do it, actually. It's just, it's just work. <laughs> uh, in OpenStreetMap, um, we're right now working on being able to actually flesh out UDIG to be a real editor. You can't, right now you can't edit OpenStreetMap in anything else than OpenStreetMap tools because OpenStreetMap is a topology and, and anything else is not a topology editor. It's actually pushing back. It's, it's, if, if you have a polygon, say, say a line string there, and you want to move it or you want to edit something, it will actually delete that line string and put a new polygon into place for you to save because the normal GIS backends just take like this blob and store it and re-index it. What we want to do is actually have the atomic operations and move that node and everything that's connected to it. So we need to enhance this to be able to do this and, and, and then even uh, introduce um, pushing back to OpenStreetMap the changes we have made. So then you have a, a generic backend. And since this will not only be visually in Unique, but even in Neo4j Spatial, you can build applications that automatically every night publish things back, which means we can enhance street map, open street map with, with real systems. So you build your REST application or your, your Java Spring or open uh, GeoMyas or whatever application and just push these back. Also what we're thinking about is stitching support. So so when when you move or when something happens, we can actually go to, to OpenStreetMap and fetch this and reattach the graph. We have all the uh, IDs there, it's no problem. We can just fetch like more bounding box XML and dynamically feed it into the graph and, and expand the data set as you need. So it's like kind of like a window moving and you can adjust your RAM. I'm right now not using North America, so uh, uh, like garbage collect this part of the graph <laughs> and then you can like move around because the, the planet OSM is big. We can hold it in neo 4 but it's not practical to, to really do hot operations on it. But with that thing, you could actually move and have different different areas in, in, in cache and even on disk in cache. Uh, we're testing with the US and Germany, and, and we're getting there. Um, yeah, and that's that's uh, uh, what we do. I would love to talk more about like dynamic layers. Um, I could possibly find the slides. I think they got lost here. Um, but but basically. Uh, what I said before, dynamic layers are uh, traversals through the graph where this information is attached. What we also want to do is we, we are supporting the whole CQL syntax in defining these layers, but we also want to, to, to do this in searches so you can actually, like right now, search is filtering, um, which, is, which is not that good. We want to have that better, but I'm, I'm, I'm not saying anything about this right now. So. In case you have forgotten your hurry. <laughs> um, questions? Yeah, so um, two questions. So the, you said this uh, route thing would be a, uh, like without any pre processing. So that would never work for, for larger data sets. No. It depends on what data set you have uh, and how long your routes are. We did, we did an A star routing. Uh, with with the uh, Romania OpenStreetMap data set that was there was 20 million nodes and 60 million relationships something like that and and the route was 700 kilometers and 5,500 turns yeah, through the graph that took under one one second so so you can do quite a lot of routing but then A star is a simplistic algorithm so it's not it's, it's, it's not the very. And, and so, what is the problem with it? So, why can't you load the whole queue for, for the whole time? Uh, it, it's basically if you want to have that in in RAM warm, it's just too big. That's that's the problem. So, if, if you do RAM clouds, we can load it. Okay, so okay, so it's yeah. a few RAM it's you can do it, uh, but it's like practical problems. You have you have to like beef up the hardware. Uh, then uh, a, a part of the routing problem is that routing is complex and, and part of the information you need for routing is not there or it's fuzzy or it's, it's, it's not provided. The data quality is too bad 
to do really good routing, for instance, in, in, the, uh, in the way elements. No one's ever supplying uh, the direction. Is this way unidirectional or is it directional or what speed can I go with and, and that, that kind of stuff. There's a lot of information missing to, to do really good routing. But you could, of course, I mean, routing is also finding a connection that's good enough for, for a number of cases or, or this thing. So we have, to, we have to take a very like low, uh, low shoot approach to a routing API and then beat that up. This is all in Neo4j now. Yeah. And is it? Uh, it's not an add-on or anything. It's just part of the core. No, it's not part of the core because uh, these add-ons pull in so many dependencies <laughs> that, 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 that we can't play. It would like double the download. But it's on GitHub, and you can you can check it out. And you can like just uh, uh, get crazy with it. Okay. And it should all work in the embedded Neo4j yep. too, right? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, it does. So, so uh, what you see in test there in the infrastructure special is running against it. The part of it we are, we're thinking of exposing by, a, by specialized REST endpoints. But when it comes to exposing to REST, we would rather support an index API, so you have special indexes, and the real special stuff you do by geo tools and geo server because these are much more powerful in their APIs than us inventing, you know, uh, serialization APIs because it's not going to work. It's a lot of work and it's probably not worth it. You're mentioning uh, SLDs. So, so where does that actually fit into the, into the structure of the project? Is the SLDs are just a um, a property on the layer definition. So they are not they are not finite. So so they will be applied when you construct the geometries or the the, the, the your search query. From the graph, you will apply the layers um, uh, SLD to it, which means uh, if you're not running GeoServer, who has styling support, then you can actually, from the GeoTools Java API, get styles. So you can actually save like the whole thing in in EFJ Spatial. Otherwise, you have to do that in, in uh, after your search somewhere else. Okay, so there's no there's no Neo4j rendering engine like that. So um, Actually, we are relying on GeoTools, but we have been uh, um, th there is a, a rendering tool chain in it, so you can actually export with the styling. You just do like a, a, a export this layer, and you would get a PNG or whatever styled according to your SLD. So Neo4js can can via GeoTools and so uh, render out stuff without GeoServer. You can do it in plain Java. There's tests uh, on that too. Are there any uh um, whole JVM we have we have wrapped part of it in in Ruby, so you can actually like very easily just import OpenStreetMap stuff. Um, and <laughs> yeah, so it's like Scala. A number of people are using it by Scala. Um, so so that's that's basically it. I mean JVM languages, syntactic sugar. <laughs> Cool.